Welcome to the Renaissance and welcome to this edition of The Negro and His Story, A Reply, Part 1. And this very important notice to you, our dear viewer, that this video is not made with the intention to offend anyone. It is not a propaganda video. It is made in good faith for educational and reference purposes. Please look for the materials referenced and study them yourself. Remember, early in the morning, we visited the Arago village of Abofo, whose chief complained bitterly of the conduct of Mohammedans of Kefi, who raid them for slaves regularly, every dry season. At one time, the people of Abofo dwelt on an island, but recently, they have removed to the mainland and built their village in the midst of the thick bush, hoping thereby to be better able to resist attacks of their enemies. A.F. Moklaferman from the book Up the Niger, published 1892. And from Etienne Felix Bilox in 1872, Mr. Baker tells us of a convoy conducted not by Arabs but by Turks. The old women carried off in the razia did not walk quickly enough. As soon as one was overcome by fatigue, she was knocked down, a blow from a club on the back of the neck, and all that remained was a body, quivering in death. The Arabs equal the talks, but their barbarity manifests itself sometimes in other ways. Behind the Mask From our last video, we saw that England surpassed every other nation in slave hunting and slave trading, the greatest slave dealer in the world. We also saw that the Fulani Caliphate in Sokoto was the largest slave trading empire in the world. And we also saw an article by the current British Prime Minister suggesting that they return to Africa to repeat what they did in the past but this time not to feel guilty for it. So ideally, they have a plan to return back to the era of slave trade or colonialism as the case may be. Remember, the United Kingdom was founded and it covers the shame of England as the greatest slave dealer in the world. It becomes clearer why the British colonialists wrote that only the Fulanis of northern Nigeria are qualified to rule the indigenous races. So we now see where that synergy is coming from. And Nigeria was founded in 1900 and included British Cameroon to also cover the Fulani Caliphate as the largest slave trading empire in the world. And so we can very easily see that without the Fulani Caliphate as the greatest slave trading empire in the world, colluding with England, the greatest slave dealer in the world, things would have been different for the Negroes all over the world. And as a quick recap, let us reference Nigeria, our latest protectorate by Charles Henry Robinson and this was published in 1900. And here we are told that England, moreover, has a far higher degree of responsibility in regard to the suppression of the slave trade than any other nation because England was for upwards of two centuries the greatest slave dealer in the world. Take note of this. Let us also reference the Sudan, a short compendium of facts and figures about the land of darkness by H. K. W. Combe, PhD, and this was published in 1907 and here we are told that Sokoto is bordered on the north by the Sahara, on the east by Borno, on the south by the regions of the Benue, and on the west by Nupe and Gando. A few years ago, it was the largest slave trading empire in the world, and even today, half its population consists probably of slaves. So you see where the alliance and the synergy of England and the Fulanese are coming from. And in the event you live in the United States or in the diaspora and you wonder why it was the Spaniards that awarded the supply of slaves contract to the English. But you wonder why English is spoken instead of Spanish 
in places like the United States, that's part of your reasons because England was the greatest slave dealer in the world. But then, as this is more or less a response video, you may have noticed some users who come on here, especially the descendants of the slave hunters back in those days, to claim that it could have been the arrow, a bunch of priests numbering less than 20, which we know is impossible because there is no way it could have been them without an army. So we see a comment from one of them who acts as an enemy within claiming to be a so-called African-American but we know that all over the place he is defending the biggest slave trading empire in the world as well as the biggest slave dealers in the world that is the English and the Fulani Caliphate in Sokoto that's all he is on this channel to do so we see a comment where he said this propensity for selling each other out is what made whites write that Igbo were raided by the Abam or whoever they are hired. Now, this is not true. They claimed or made this claim after the fact, which is part of why we are making this video. But this individual has been on this channel to try to defend the slave masters and his slave hunting partners, that's the English and the Fulanese. And so, if we reference a material from a controlled scholar, remember what we mean by controlled scholar here are the scholars used by these great slave trading empires and countries to deceive everyone else. So they are now writing that it could have been the arrow so as to exonerate the real culprits. So we reference the slave trade, warfare and arrow expansion in the Igbo hinterland, Trans-African Journal of History and this was by John Origi and published 1987 and here we see a map so from the map on your screen they are trying to make you believe that the Arochuku you see on your screen and the Abam you see those two tiny places were behind the millions sold all over the world or that all the slaves came from what they now claim to be Igbo land so that's what they want people to believe so you see how the lie collapses if you apply common sense to it because there is no way you could have gotten over five or six million people from a place with a population less than that you need to bear that in mind but the slave master is a subtle beast and so this author goes on to say the way in which the arrow used warriors who were collectively called the abam to expand in the Igbo hinterland has engaged the attention of modern historians. D. Notrop, whose work attempted to rehabilitate the slave trade, was critical of the bias researchers have shown in discussing the use of warfare and raids in the recruitment of slaves, as he put it. Now remember, slaves were never recruited, they were captured. That's the important thing you have to note. But the controlled authors from the slave master's side, that is those who were not abolitionists and those who supported and defended the slave trade, were often deceived that it could have been a cell. So some of them who could not come down physically to see how it was done would write that it was a cell. It becomes the duty of their slave hunting partners to maintain that it could have been a cell. Now think about it yourself. How can one man or woman or 10 men without guns, without anything, capture 400 men, women and children and match them over distances that spans days? How do they feed them? Remember, like we always tell you, it was done by the army. Like you see the Nigerian army today, you see it abusing people. You see that there is no humanity in them. That was the same way they were slave hunters. They lack humanity. They lack common sense. Think about it. How can you, as an individual, assuming you are a Negro, capture people that are even pregnant, pregnant women, and walk distances that span days with them, and when they get tired, you hit them on the head and they die? You remember, this is something that can only be done by what you call Nigerian army today. At least you have seen how abusive they are. You have seen that they lack any sense of humanity or common sense. You have seen that the slave master turns the other way, no matter how many people they massacre or murder. So that should explain to you 
how they worked together with their slave hunting partners and how they worked together back in the days. If you doubt what we're saying, just put it in the comment section. Remember, the descendants of the slave hunters will want you to believe that it could have been a cell or they try to tell you that it could have been the Arab priests. Yet, they cannot mention the name of one of them. Remember, there is no mention of one of them and they are trying to make you believe that the slave master could have bought slaves from circa 1434 to circa 1900 and they don't know the name of one of the people they were buying the slaves from. Meanwhile, they recorded that the Sultan of the Fulani, now called Sultan of Sokoto, was the wholesale merchant in Negro slaves. But it goes further to say, those wishing to bring out the cruelty of the system to those enslaved or the negative impact on Africa have concerned themselves with the more brutal techniques of the trade, such as wars and raids. Yet, there is considerable evidence that various other techniques were in use and that in many cases the raid or war played a minor role in the procurement of slaves. So you see a controlled scholar telling us that raids and wars played minor role but other means were used to acquire the slaves. Now we challenge you based on your common sense only. There was a system of raid done by what you call your Nigerian army today. And then there was another system nobody can talk about, nobody can describe, nobody can mention. According to them, they say it was because of the oracle they were recruiting the slaves. Tell us how you can go to a man or woman's house and then recruit him and his wives and his children and he follows you over days. And then you do it like that and capture an entire village. That's our challenge to you. Remember, like we always tell you, the descendants of the slave hunters, they lack humanity. They lack common sense. They are typically like what you call your Nigerian army today. We are a man like them. will send them to go and be killing people. They can't feed their families. They can't feed their children. They can't equip their homes. And they go and be killing people while the politicians that are sending them have their own children schooling abroad. You will see the same level of foolishness from the comments from the descendants of the slave hunters. So you just have to ignore them and research things yourself. And it goes further to say, Northrop then used examples drawn from Iboland to reinforce the view that violence was not a major instrument for recruiting slaves in the Biafran hinterland. Please note that this John Origi is typically like Professor Gates. And then this Northrop is more like David Eltis. Those that wrote the book he claims are gold standards. What the slave master normally does is he will write what he wants to sell to the Negroes. It most times will not be true. And then he will hide behind a house Negro to market that lie. John Origi is just like Professor Gates on the other side. That's just what they do. So you see, he is trying to tell us here that Northrop is saying that violence wasn't a major way of getting slaves. Notice his use of the term recruiting. Now ask yourself how they could have recruited 400 people, 700 people, ships moving back and forth, shipping men and those so-called African Americans, Jamaicans, Haitians, Black Cubans, Afro-Brazilians that you see today. You see how their lives collapse. If you go to Encyclopedia Britannica as well, you see the use of the term recruit as if they were going from place canvassing for people to come and become slaves and they agreed you need to understand the slave master the slave master is a subtle beast but he is only as smart as the negroes are gullible and only as smart as his slave hunting partners are foolish that's all he is not as sophisticated as you might be thinking and he goes further to say in his contribution kdk who appeared to be fascinated by the organization of the arrow oracular trade network stated that warfare raids and kidnapping played a subordinate role to the arrow oracle ubino barbie and then he adds chuku now note that this author is supposedly an Igbo person he wants you to believe that the same chuku that you see Igbos call god today is the same chuku that helped them recruit the slaves. Remember, everyone understands that to deceive the Negroes, note that the Negroes are just the same people. Forget all these appellations, which we shall look at in a subsequent video. If you add God to whatever lie you are telling them, find a way to smuggle God 
into it. The Negro becomes confused or deceived. He starts following and believing whatever lie you are telling him in the name of God. That's why you see him in churches as well. See him in mosques, see him everywhere. Everybody that forms a new religion just looks for the Negroes because they know that they will buy into the lie, provided you append God in one way or another into that lie. And so, permit us to ask you, when they tell you that it could have been through an oracle that they could have gotten 400 to 700 men, women and children, that is emptying an entire village, we want you to explain to us how possible that could have been before we even go into further details to prove to you beyond any reasonable doubts that they are lying. And that's how smart the slave master plays. He positions his slave hunting partners as rulers in those countries and then prepares lies like this. So they will put it in the academic curriculum such that the children are fed with the lies so that when they grow old, it becomes extremely difficult to expunge that lie from them. And please remember that this is coded in Proverbs 22 verse 6. And to better understand it, look at the Aborigine narrative and the likes of the Nkalawe contracted to propagate that lie. You might think he is doing it for this generation, but the target is for the next generation. The children would have started being fed with that lie. Remember, the adults know it's a lie. They won't bother about it. They won't believe it. Only very gullible few we believe him and those lies but the children will start hearing it by the time they grow old or become adults they will believe that they could have been indians and then like marcus Garvey, they could go to somebody like uh, hele celestia and he won't be ready to help them because they are not siblings but they have grown up misfed with the lies of the slave master that they could have been the same with somebody who is not really their brother and so you take good note of the fact that this other author, KDK, also said Ibn Ubabi or the Oracle, accounting for the large number of people they are all recruited into slavery, which doesn't make sense because it limits the number of slaves and people sold into slavery as coming from the same area, which is impossible because if you remember, they only carried slaves who spoke different languages. So if he was only Igbo, how could they have done it? You see how that collapses. If you still have any doubts or you haven't researched it yourself, put it in the comment section or you can put it in the library because YouTube censors our comments so that we can also take it further. And please, we want you to compare these accounts with something like the West and the rest of us, white predators, black slavers and the African elite published 1975 by Chinwezu. To understand what we're talking about you will see how the accounts differ but there's only one truth it's impossible that they could have recruited millions of people from a place that had less than that population and it is not recorded anywhere that the arrow or the abams conducted any slave raids they came up with this much later after the slave trade had even ended let us also reference descriptive ethnology by algae latham volume 2 and this was published 1859 and here we are told that the fullers exhibit a decided physical and moral superiority over the ordinary negroes this being chiefly due to their mohammedanism although the particular shade of the particular color which best suits the fuller is not a matter upon which authors write with unanimity the testimony of all observers goes to the fact that whether Filani or Felatha, Felatha or Fula, whether Pagan or Mohammedan, whether Sudanian or Senegambian, whether Mountaineer or Desert born, the Fula is something peculiar. Sometimes his complexion is intermediate to that of the African and the more. Sometimes he is described as being tawny with soft hair and with lips by no means prominent sometimes the skin is of a reddish black the countenance being regular the tribe of fullers writes Galberry, which under the name of fools or peoles has peopled the borders of the senegal between Podhorn and galam are black with a tinge of red or copper color they are in general handsome and well made 
the women are handsome but proud and indolent. However, our interest here is where it says the Fullers exhibit a decided physical and moral superiority over the ordinary Negroes. So we are wondering what criteria they could have used to arrive at that. Remember, these were their slave hunting partners. So take note of all they will be saying about them. They have to incite them. They have to deceive them. They have to tell them things that will make them be doing what they are doing. And so here we see a path of what they are doing today and what they are using them for. Please remember that the bulk of the slave raiding and slave hunting were done by Europeans and Arabs. You need to understand that. So that's why you see them send their foot soldiers to keep saying it could have been the arrow. The arrow did not have that capacity and there is no record of anything like that anywhere. So he says here the fuller. Towards the end of the last century, a vast number of wandering pastoral tribes spread over that part of Central Africa, which is called Sudania, and underwent a change in respect to their social and political organization, which Pritchard compares with that of the Arabs at the time of Muhammad. Remember, they claimed they are messengers of Islam too. You need to understand it as well. It was part of the slave hunts and conquest of the Fulani. Many, but not all, of them embraced Mohammedanism and that with more than ordinary zeal and devotion. They visited the more civilized parts of Barbary. They performed pilgrimages to Mecca. They recognized in one of their sheikhs called Damfodio, a prophet with a mission to preach, to convert, to conquer. Under his inspiration, they attacked the pagan populations of the countries around Gobert to the north and Kubi to the south, Zamfara, Kashnia, and parts of the Hausa country to the east. Their war cry was Allah Koba. Their robes and flags were white. Remember, the Oba of Benin you have today is a Fulani. We shall prove that to you. Those things were created by the slave master and his slave hunting partners. They are not indigenous to the area which will challenge you to research yourself and you will discover what we're telling you. The reason you believe they are ancient, like ancient Bini Kingdom, ancient Ife and all that, is because that's what the slave master told you. You have never researched them yourself. And it goes further to say, emblematic of their purity. Take note of this statement that wearing white was emblematic of their purity. If you go and listen to the Oba of Benin also, you will see him re-thread the same thing because he is a Fulani. You can see them talking about an election in Edo, but they are talking about Dangote and they are talking about who they are giving them to. Why not spend some time and ask yourself why do they all run to Sokoto to get power in the south? That's because the Fulani conquest is still ongoing with their slave hunting partners, mainly the British, supporting them with everything they need. And it goes further to say, Kano was conquered without a blow. So was Yaori. So was the town of Eyo or Katunga on the Niger. So was part of the Nufi or Tupua country. Even the frontier of Bruno was violated. Now we ask you, if there was anybody called Yoruba by this time, you would have seen it somewhere here. What you call all those areas today was Katunga. That's the Katunga you are seeing. Remember, the slave master gives the names. That is what is coded in Adam, giving all the animals of the field names. Certainly, you wouldn't believe that Adam could have been the one that named the penguin or was the penguin created in the garden as well. But that's by the way, our interest is for you to see how the slave master is playing his game with his slave hunting partners. And he goes further to say, Danfodio's death, which took place in 1818, was preceded by fits of religious madness. Not, however, before he had consolidated a great Felata kingdom and become the terror to the states around. So that's who you celebrate today when you are saying Ottoman Danfodio said this or said that. You have to remember that that was a brutal terrorist at that time. But then, the same way you see something like the Nigerian army, which was his slave hunting militia renamed and rebranded with his slave hunting partners, mainly the British, 
and you see them kill people today, abuse civilians, burn down villages, the same way they did as slave hunters, but you will turn around to be blaming those that ask for freedom. You may blame Kano for asking for freedom. That was also exactly how the slave trade happened. If the Negroes try to rise up, then others will go and tell Massa that these ones don't want to be good slaves anymore. The same thing. So you see how you would leave the army that was supposedly protecting all of us as a people, but then protecting only the Fulani and helping the Fulani conquer the rest of us. You leave them for doing the wrong things and be talking about somebody else who is saying, let things be done right. Let our place develop. Let there be peace in the land. Let everyone stay in his own land, not for you to come from Futa Jelon and impose your views on other people. But of course, the slave hunters and their slave trading partners, the Europeans, mainly the British, they send their emissaries ahead. So within you, they must have an enemy within. So when you are saying you want freedom, those enemies within, born when you never knew, will be saying something different. But you will think they are your siblings. They are not. Like we tell you today, the Oba of Benin is a Fulani man. And you can trace him to Ileife or trace him to anywhere. All we challenge you to do is to find out when those places were named whatever names they bear today. Like you see Katunga here, research Katunga. You will understand what we're saying the moment you conduct that research.